00 Direct is live on KTN News every Saturday from midday. How are you this afternoon? I'm Olivia Tiano. This, of course, is 00 Direct, a safe space for women with a woman host, music by women, only women guests. Right now, with me, two phenomenal women. In fact, it's taken me several months, and it's my own fault, yeah, to get them here. I'm talking about Renee Ngamau, an activist and lawyer, and Teresa Njiroge, the executive director and founder of Clean Start Ladies. Welcome to Double O Direct. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's so nice to have you. I'm going to start with you, Teresa, because you're the one I know least about. Tell me about yourself. So my name is Teresa Njiroge. I'm the founder and the CEO of Clean Start Africa, which is the first women by women for women social justice enterprise uh, working to empower and transform imprisoned and formerly imprisoned women uh, here in Kenya but across the continent as well that is amazing Renee well wow what should I tell you um, I wear different hats but um, by background and um, in practice, I'm a lawyer. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Been in practice here um, and in other jurisdictions. I have the privilege of serving as a director at Clean Start Africa. And um, in addition to that, I consider myself not just a human rights activist, but an African feminist, which is the thing that excites me the most. I'm an African. I'm a feminist like my grandmother. I'm the feminist that takes care of everyone in the village. Have people eaten? Are they living in dignity? What happened to so-and-so's kid? And has the oldest person in our village been taken care of? That's what I'm about, I think. I love it. It's so phenomenal. Now, just to unpack, uh, what is Clean Start Teresa. So Clean Start Africa is a social enterprise that I had the opportunity uh, by God's grace of setting up after my own first-hand personal experience with the criminal justice system. After I had been um, wrongfully convicted, I previously had been maliciously arrested and wrongfully prosecuted. And it was the first hand experience of meeting women, girls and their children behind bars. And, you know, my eyes were open to the injustices that a lot of especially the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized women go through when they get arrested due to survival, petty crimes, i.e. hoaxing, loitering. Um, and it's all a product of the broken systems, broken education system whose supply and quality is not equal for all. A health system that not everyone can access the services. Social economic um, issues where you find women do not have economic opportunities. Where do they go to? And for me, prior to this, I would interact with them through reading the statistics. For example, 500,000 did not make the cut to join the universities. Um, the poverty line in Kenya is at 20, 30%. And these statistics had not translated to the people themselves. And so when I got wrongfully imprisoned, I met the women and the girls who made up those statistics. And for me, something had to be corrected because I believe poverty is not a crime and we cannot address our social economic issues with a criminal justice lens. So we set up Clean Start as a group of women who had been through the criminal justice system. And we said we want to make it better for other women who are in the system, in prisons, and coming out back into society, better for them than we had it rough and hard. But as we do that, prevent others from going through that system. And that's what um, CleanSat is all about. We also advocate for non-custodial sentencing, for those who commit petty offenses. And we're across Kenya. We work within the 44 women prisons, um, have formed chapters for formerly imprisoned women across the country, but have started making our inroads in various African countries to reach out to women. Teresa, well. are you comfortable unpacking for me what led to your incarceration? Sure. So I worked within the financial sector and for a very long time, this is a career I dreamt of. Um, 
taking off from the footsteps of my dad, who was a career banker for about three decades. So as a young little girl, I, all I wanted to be was a banker. Did you grow up middle class, upper Mid class? Middle class, middle class, you okay. know, um, two parent home. My mom was a homemaker. Uh, my dad was a banker. Lovely family um, five siblings. Uh, it was fantastic. Our parents provided everything we needed and um, it was fantastic. And uh, uh, in uh, campus, when I had to choose what you know, I would major in. I majored in banking and finance. Why? Because I had seen the example and the role model that my dad was to us and to me. Um, as luck would have it, I finally ended up in the banking sector and I grew that career for about 10, 10 years. And then this one day we pay out 9.9 .9 million and Two, three months later, we're told that transaction was fraudulent. And so I'm very excited because we will finally now get to unpack who dropped the ball, what happened, um, and get this case resolved for the bank to recoup its money and whoever was responsible to carry the cross for that. But unfortunately, an arresting officer walks into the bank and says to me, I'm here to arrest you in conjunction to transaction XYZ. And I'm like, no, but you have the wrong person. But the arresting officer says to me, I know you did not commit this crime. What? Yes, I know. Whilst they're arresting. Yes, we know. So stop causing mayhem and telling us how we're wrong. We know that. And um, after taking me through the entire process of me writing a statement, they locked me up at Kilelesha police station. And at that time, he's asking me, would you have a million Kenya shillings cash? Huh? It was happening so quick and fast. I wasn't fathoming that people would walk into your workplace, arrest you. So you were arrested at work in at front work. of your colleagues? Yes, and customers. And customers? Yes. It was so traumatizing. It was so Around embarrassing. Around which year was this? This was in 2009. And someone is thinking you have a million shillings cash. Cash. And he's saying to me, if I give him the a million Kenya shillings cash, he'll drop this case. But, and, but he also told you that he knows you didn't do it. Yes. So, pause. We're going to circle back. In our criminal justice system, sounds like an oxymoron, but I'm going to continue. Are we guilty until proven innocent? Or are we innocent until proven guilty? Or is that from TV? Well, it depends on at what level you're asking that question. What the law says yes. and versus what the practice is. And I love what um, Teresa is pointing out because of the number of people who go through that. Number one, a faulty um, investigation where there is real clarity on the culprit. But then there is a decision that appears to be made at some level that this is the person who is most vulnerable and therefore this is the person who we are going to put under pressure to make sure that they can toa kitu kidogo. So it's, a not, a, so it's, so it's not about uh, we need to arrest someone for the crime. It's more about uh, who can we shake down or shake down. In, in, in order to profit. And let's call this what it is, Olivia. And, 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 and at the level of Teresa, who is a bank manager, right the way to the level of the Mama Fua, who is at the corner of Riara and uh, Ole Dume, waiting to, be, to, to get a job for that day for 500 shillings so that she can wash clothes and take them to her home. This is an endemic problem. And the, unfortunately, we don't call it out. Or when we do, it is classified as a few rogue officers. We need to address this at a systemic level. And it's more than just that. It is, it is the the humiliation and the way in which arrests happen and we'll be stepping into that in a short while but i think there's something else that i want to underscore uh, around Teresa's story and around so many stories that are similar to this is that investigations in and of themselves need to become a matter of public record at some point and not just there has to be a train that of a trail of investigation that can be audited 
so that when we are getting to the point of prosecution or when the ODPP is receiving a file, they can be able to look through this and actually see at what point does this person become culpable? What is the evidence? And what exculpa exculpating evidence, expul exculpatory evidence, excuse me, do they have that may actually be mitigating against the circumstances? As well as ensuring, you see, the law says that we are innocent until we're proven That's guilty. What I, that was my, you see, that was okay. my question. Yeah. And yet, Thank you for coming to that because, okay. We so are operating as though we are guilty. We're guilty. And they have to... And then we're working backwards trying to prove our innocence from allegations that have been made. Mm -hmm. I want Teresa to continue telling her story before I tell you the story of being arrested myself because I have been arrested. And my charge sheet saying eight men. Huh? Okay, pause. <laughs> Pause, pause. But let's just go back to this story I, I, I first. Did, I didn't know that I was in the minority here of <laughs> never having been arrested. Although I was almost arrested. I was on the edge of arrest, but I was never arrested. Teresa, kindly continue. And that this is precisely what now I came to learn. Yes. That these people who are the duty bearers and the right holders within the criminal justice system are not held accountable for the outcomes of their actions. And um, I continue. So I got terminated from the banking industry. Uh, I was in the newspapers as the bank manager thief. And my story was all over. So you can imagine the shame, the embarrassment that this caused not just to me, but to my family as well. My mom is, you know, everyone's saying to my mom, oh, your daughter is a bank manager thief. My sister who had to drop out of school because they were depending on me and now being told, oh, your sister is a thief. That embarrassment that comes to the family that's trying to come into terms with what has happened. Mm -hmm. Two and a half years later, they now ask me, we need to meet and we need to discuss about a five million uh, payment because the stakes are really high now. We're going into judgment. And I say to the arresting officer, but there has been no evidence whatsoever that I stole the money. Because how do they prove something that never happened? E exactly. And how do you build a case beyond the point of uh, um, that the, there's a case to answer? You see, when you start a court case, uh, you'll get to the point where the prosecution will present its case. And then the magistrate or judge must make a ruling on whether this person will be put to their defense. So far, we have not found evidence enough that beyond unless there is an explanation to the contrary then there is enough there's sufficient evidence to suggest that this person should now be taking the steps towards a sentencing how did we get to case to answer and on those, evidence like this I, I, okay and in those two years where were you so i was out of work and i'm relying on my savings i'm relying on my family and relatives to bail me out first because the family had to come together to bail me out from Langata Women Maximum Remand Center. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sorry. Do we have categorization of crime with regards to where you're placed? Like if it's white collar, if it's murder, if it's... I, I, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. So... Unf unfortunately, in Nairobi, yeah. we don't have smaller um, prisons. For, for, for lower crimes. We only have Langata women maximum prison. So irrespective of what someone is imprisoned for, as they're awaiting judgment, if they're not let out on bail, and please correct all my terminologies, I'm, this is TV law that I'm <laughs> reciting here, um, they all go to Langata women's prison? Yes. So it's it's so just to back up at this point, she hasn't technically been imprisoned at this point. Um, she's had uh, she's answered. So she's gone to court. Uh, she, the charges have been read. She's pleaded not guilty. And then she has been sentenced to remand or she has been told that she will pay an amount of bail and we'll come back to the amount of bail that is put for that is set by magistrates and what it does by way of perpetuating an injustice. You have situations where, and we have women like these in, at Clean Start and in our prisons today, where the, the, the crime, the value of the crime is 3,000, 5,000, even 500 shillings. The bail is set at 20,000 shillings. This is a woman who makes 300 shillings a day. In other words, there is not a snowball's hell 
of a chance that she will make this money. And therefore, even before she has been found guilty, let alone sentenced, she is already beginning to serve a term that is now no longer related to the crime. It is related directly to the fact that she is poor. I'm, I'm circling back to the fact that you were put into Langata Women's Prison to be held as you tried to post this exorbitant amount or whatever amount of bail it was. And that whether we call it remand, whether we call it what, she's in jail with criminals who have been sentenced, yes. and who are serving time. Yes, you're all put together, whether you committed murder, whether robbery vi by violence, whether you were arrested in the streets walking home and now you're in because you were loitering, whether you were hawking, whether you were calling a customer loudly and so the Kanjo came and picked you up, you're all put together. Whenever it is you will post bail, then you can be able to go and answer to your case on the outside. But for now, you're all here. And that's when my eyes started opening up because these women are telling you I'm in here because I can't post bail worth a thousand shillings, two thousand shillings, three thousand shillings. Why? Because I was walking in the streets and there's a petty offense called loitering. loitering. Mm -hmm. I was I, I was calling the customers loudly and so the kanjo said I was whistling loudly and so I caused harm and they've they, they've given me 10,000 bob or I'm in here for three years and mm. so on and noise so pollution. forth. And noise pollution. Mm. But apparently as Renee says it's very clear that we put we we we, we criminalize status because there wasn't any one of my status in there i was in there because i needed to pay a million kenya shillings cash bail on that day which i didn't have and it's so funny that it was an equivalent amount as what the arresting officer was asking me mm. at the point of arrest it was the exact same amount that the magistrate asked me for so i was in because i couldn't raise the a million bob instantly but i was in with women who couldn't raise a thousand shillings 2,000 shillings for very petty, petty offenses. And two and a half years later, post going in and out of courts, proving that I'm innocent, they dropped all the charges that I was up against of stealing, but they took me in for a year on the charge of I had conspired somehow some way i knew it was a criminal it was a it, it was a fraudulent transaction with who i conspired with there was no one w wait a minute wait a minute you were in jail for an entire year with my daughter with your three-month-old daughter i think you must underscore that is the age of the children who go to prison because it's from birth to f the age of four which is now the next injustice we have children in prison serving terms for crimes they never committed but for the singular sin of having been born to this particular woman whether or not she is rightly incarcerated olivia this is so much to unpack the injustice is so glaring the responses and the way to fix this are simple not easy but they're simple but we need a service, a judiciary, that, and a parliament that see women, that see Kenyans beyond their poverty, that see them beyond their level of education, that are not enslaved to criminal and particularly penal codes that are still hooked to colonial times and to an English system that is not relevant to us. We need to do something different. And I hope today's conversation really triggers that. I want to underscore just something within this experience. Yes. For two and a half years, you're back and forth in court. Two and a half years. So, Teresa, you paid the one million shillings bail at some point and you got out. Yes. How long did it take you to raise that money? A week. Okay. People came together. Wali changa, changa wakakuwekea, ukatoka. Continue. Two and a half years of going back and forth. Yes. And then you've got to ask yourself, if this person is not guilty of this crime, then how do we as society, and I want to pull it out from the judicial system. It's very easy to point out to the police and to the judiciary and to say it's their fault. But I want to speak to us as well even where we are sat today, that for two and a half years, already by virtue of having been uh, charged, then she is guilty in the eyes of society. So to an extent, 
it really would not have mattered had she been acquitted. The level of stigma that our women go through is exactly the same. And I'm going to bring it even closer home. Get ready to get uncomfortable, everyone. Mm. This is about to be it. You put a headline with thief, banker, photo of somebody who has been charged. Mm. Even when they are acquitted, the story will come out on page 17 as a tiny little column in a place that is next to the auctioneers. Mm. I know I've been in this industry. Yes. yes. What have we done? We have criminalized beyond the judicial system. And our women, even when they have been released, whether through acquittal or through appeal, continue to pay a sentence for a crime they did not commit because between the media and our society, we refuse to step down from a position nobody appointed us as, as judges and arbiters and executioners of something for which we have misreported, we have misrepresented, and we have sat on that high pedestal and judged ourselves the arbiter of women who have gone through a system like this. So everyone who has been to remand, or if you've been arrested and you've been to jail, wewe ni mwizi. You are a thief. The end. We don't need to know your circumstances or before. And even let's talk about the ones who justly were arrested and imprisoned. When you've done the crime and you've done the time, at what point do we say, this is over you are now released for those who come from some kind of religious background we believe that there is a god who um, says okay we've drawn the line under your sin you're now a different kind of person if the maker can what is it about us as human beings that makes us so special that we are unable to see beyond a historical crime and see the humanity of a person who is trying to raise themselves from their past and release them from their past and see them as who they are today, who they could be going forward, and not the circumstance that had brought them to the point where they were back then. And I'm bringing it to society, to media, but we haven't even discussed the certificate of good conduct and the inability of people to get that certificate simply because they have a sentence. Olivia, there's so many places we I, could go. I needed to unpack the fact that you have a three-month-old baby <laughs> in, prison. in prison, number one. Number two, I go back to every single visa application. Have you ever been arrested? They don't say, have you ever been jailed or convicted? Or It's, it's always, have you ever been arrested? Or have you ever had any sort of disciplinary hearing or something? something it's always a long long list i always go no 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 because for me at the back of my mind on anything because i started making these applications ages ago even before work applications they were just ingrained in my mind coming back to you and this certificate of good conduct but the very fact that you were in prison for a year were you pregnant at the time like well how did that yeah occur yeah i just need to unpack that before we take a break so when i got out on bail yes no work, no nothing. I started now growing my family. Yes. With, you know, instead of just sitting there and yes. all I do is go to court, come back. And in a month, I would be in court for three months and any for three weeks, for three times in a month. And any time I am not um, stating my evidence, I am answering some mentions in between. So it's a full time job. Yes. And so I, I, I decided, OK, let me grow my grow my family. Yes. And um, as, as I fight this case. Yes. Um, so what is your first child? Your second? Yes. Child? My first child. Your first. My child. first born. I can now see the, the, the drive to grow your family because yeah. I would have done the same. You know, you, yeah. you, you, you you're not working. Yes. You've been. Yes. What else? Yes. You know, and this was the only place I could find meaning now. Yes. Um, so close so close to judgment, I'm asked for the five million Kenya shillings. And I'm like, you better be kidding me. There has been no evidence whatsoever that I stole the money. Yes. Um, so my daughter at that time of the sentencing was three months old. And I was so excited on that day because I was so certain that... Today is the day I get my justice and I get my freedom. By the way, my daughter is called Omar. In my dialect, it, it, it means truth. Yes. Truth and justice. I was so sure this is the day I finally, finally get to be released and get my freedom. But we go in, all the charges are dropped. 
we get to conspiracy and they say you might have known that this transaction was fraudulent and you might have conspired with some people and i immediately i started asking so why was i conspiring not to steal the money what was the end game for me to conspire? And you also might have wings and able to fly out of the courtroom. <laughs> exactly. What is, what, like, what is happening with our legal system? What do you mean you, you might know, have? And, and you know something? Throughout the, the reason why we took two and a half years yes. to litigate this case is because the arresting officer kept requesting for time to adjourn to go and get evidence. Mm. And I kept wondering, why is the magistrate allowing this man to go get evidence, that yet he already... Exist. Yet he already arrested He's already me. charged you. And More charged me. This matter is before court. So what did he arrest me and charge me on if he doesn't have the evidence? You're waiting to hear that you can go home. You cannot go home. We have to take a break. I need to find out how the arrest ensued. This is especially for you. Ice FM. Ice FM. Also, welcome to everyone joining us on KTN News. I'm Olivia Otieno. This is Double O Direct, woman host, music by women, only women guests every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm with two phenomenal women, women who've overcome a lot and are lending their time and lending their expertise to try and make life that much better for those who really are finding it hard to do it on their own. Renee Ngamau, she's an activist and a lawyer, and I have Teresa Njoroge, executive director and founder of Clean Start, a former woman behind bars, wrongfully accused, wrongfully imprisoned, and we left it where you and your three-month-old daughter, Oma, yes. were about to spend a year in Langata Women's Prison. Yes. The most horrific time. Um of our lives yet because um, when we got into prison she's three months I'm so traumatized wondering what has just happened going through the imagination of how unjust our criminal justice system can get and I'm in prison now thinking gosh I've come in and I'll be with all these criminals, how will I survive with my child? But I get into my cell after I've now worn the prison uniform, given my number 415 stroke 11, and that's, you know, your identity is gone. Um, and I meet 60 other women accompanied by their children in this small cell with one little toilet. And I'm like, you better be kidding me. You're 60 of you? We're 60 of us. And it's from an infant. At that time, they, they, they held children up to seven years. And we're, you know, we're so squeezed, so overcrowded. And I'm wondering, what are all these children doing in here? We have no space. We, have no, in, we don't have enough water. And I'm, and, I'm, and, and I'm starting to wonder, how will I bath my child? How will we survive here? How, how, you know, and it, all I remember is the smell. Mm -hmm. Because they, we, we didn't have good aeration. Uh, the small little toilet, water wasn't flowing. And the population was just too much um, in, 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 the, in, the, in this small cell uh, that we were all held up. And, and three months into this sentence of wondering, gosh, what am I doing here? Of course, following up with my appeal case, as I'm in here, because I had been given 14 days to appeal the case, which I did. My appeal case is ongoing. I can't wait to leave. But three months in prison, I started looking at the other women and the other children. So when you're in prison, when you come into prison, you're given duties. The duty I was given was to take care of their children as their mothers went out to do other work. Uh, we depended a lot on well-wishers to come and bring food, stuffs, clothing, and other necessities for the children. But as I spoke to the women, and a little bit fast forward, I can now back up what I saw in prison to a study that we've recently done. One, 90% of the women who are in prisons, single sole breadwinners of their families. So the cry was uniform. Where are my children? How are they surviving out there? They were the sole caregivers. So the children all by themselves. The children who were left on the outside, 69% of them below 
10 years. So they're at the age where they really need their mothers. I can back up now what I saw with the, with the research report that we did. 74% of the women that I was serving time with and who are in prisons today earned between 100 shillings to 300 shillings a day. It's 74%. the poor. 74% of the women in prisons today earned between 100 to 300 shillings a day. And that is when they can make that money. Meaning... 74% of women behind bars are those of low social economic status and 81% of them could not afford and never had legal representation. So they were arrested and came in here. What really hurt me while I was in prison is seeing the women leave prison and then come right back within weeks of being released and the women saying it's much better here in prison because i can't afford rent rent is 3k to 4k they can't afford it i don't have food for my children i can't afford school fees so it's the poor and we are addressing poverty in a criminal manner because when she goes to hoke or when she goes to look for work she's then arrested because she can't afford legal representation, she ends up in prison. And this resulted to a lot of overcrowding. I mean, if the 74% are in due to petty survival crimes, they are poor. The law provides for them to get non-custodial sentencing. They can be corrected within society, which means the overcrowding we have in prisons is self-inflicted. We are refusing to give non-custodial sentencing and sentencing each, sentencing each and every person we come across overcrowding our prisons. My question is, with regards to non-custodial sentencing, how is that executed? Is it a request that is put in? Where then do they have to go? How then is that monitored? Who then is responsible right, for ensuring that it occurs? I'm going to take that uh, and ask you, Renee. Um, I understand it's very, very emotional for Teresa to relive and, 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 and go down this path again. So let's try and understand that. So um, there are alternatives to many, not all, uh, sentences. So the, um, you could do community service, um, pay a fine, or go to prison. But they, the, the practice within the bench is not to give community service and therefore the alternative becomes either a fine or imprisonment now if you pay the fine you don't get a record if you go to prison you get a record and therefore immediately the component that we're focused on is the inability to pay the fine for community service Originally, it used to be that you go and cut grass at the chiefs or uh, clean the roads. But this is an impractical community sentence for a woman who has to go and take care of her children. And so, and we'll talk about this if we have a little bit of time. As Clean Start, we came up with an alternative. How about if they had um, skills that they had to learn, classes that they had to attend, but for a short period during the day so that they could be able to spend the rest of the time actually raising money, doing the work so that they can take care of this, their children. Because remember, the thing that has brought them to prison in the first place is that they were trying to fend for their children. And it's as simple as this. Just keep in mind a, a scene that we will see very often in Nairobi. The city council Ascari City County, Ascari, chasing women who are selling tomatoes at 5 p.m. on Tomboya Street. They grab the tomatoes whose value is 300 shillings. Sometimes they will even put them in front of the truck and crush them. Or they will drive away with the woman and her tomatoes, valued at 300 shillings, or the sweets that she was selling in a matatu, valued at 200 shillings, and then will hold her overnight. Ask the question, what happens to the children that night? Let me tell you what happens because I've now seen it with my own eyes. If this woman is taken through the criminal justice system and gets to the point where she is sentenced to two or three thousand shillings or a fine, they're usually agents of the landlord who are sitting in the court to see whether she'll be able to raise the money. If she is unable to raise the money, they go and put a padlock on the door. These children are now out on the street that night, Olivia, that night, those children are likely to be raped and sodomized that night, not the next night. So when this woman now comes out, she is broken 
because it is the nature of the criminal of, of prisons and the way in which they were built and the way in which they are operated. And I want to give a real shout out to the Kenya Prison Systems uh, Services because they've worked really hard to reform their officers. But the way in which the entirety of that process is designed, it is designed to break the human spirit. So now she's broken. And then she comes out and she finds her 10, her 11 year old has been exchanging, um, has been having to survive by trading sexual services for 50 or 100 shillings. They're called shots. And that this child from the age of nine or 10 has been sexualized, sometimes even younger has been sexualized and is now making money that way. When she comes out, it's too overwhelming. She will choose to go back in because she doesn't have a pathway out. And this is what we're trying to do at Clean Start. It's because of these stories that we now look at how, how do we stop the devastation of children who now, when they grow up, by 16, if that boy is not in you ngeta, which means he is mugging you on the street. If that child does not have such a huge hatred for women and men like you and I, who seem to have privilege and did not care when they were vulnerable, then we continue to grow criminals. And we do so because we refuse to address a system that can be addressed. We're always pointing to systems like Sweden or Norway and the fact that they have closed prisons. Let's look closer home. Rwanda has closed prisons. How? Because they have dealt with the issue of poverty-related crime by putting in place the systems that allow for men and women to earn dignified wages and live in dignified, affordable ways that remove them from the indignity of having to stand on the corner of the street and sell your body because no matter what this person does to you tonight, your children must eat and therefore... You must enter that car because you don't know how else to make money knowing that you may very well be arrested tonight in Kamata Kamata Friday. And if that happens and you don't have a system with other single mothers for someone to take your child tonight, your child will be sodomized. We've got to draw this down to where it is and to refuse to allow that the reforms that we're doing and a big shout out to the judiciary and the honorable the chief justice for re-looking at this penal code but to to no longer allow that this will be a three-year-old process because tonight saturday night tonight there are children who are paying the price for their mother having been too poor to pay 1000 shillings at the police station where she is and so on monday she will be arraigned, uh, arraigned to Makadara, to Kibra, to any of the other courts. And we must question once again, look at the numbers that the Kenya Prison Service is putting up as the numbers of people who are in remand and who are in prison. And when those numbers go up exponentially, to take a step back and ask, why are these numbers going up? Right now, our remand prisons right across, particularly in the urban centers, are holding one, one and a half times two times what they're able, their capacity is to hold. And when you look right across the way, whether men or women, they are being held in the majority, 74% of the women, and those numbers are climbing. They are being held for poverty-related crimes. Or in the case of women, the other thing that has them imprisoned a lot is that they had been abused for a period of time and had been in a relationship where they felt locked in. And at some point when they were in the midst of that domestic violence, she deigned to hit back. And that became the crime without putting a consideration onto the exculpate, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, circumstances, the historical circumstances of the history of her abuse, where neighbors will say, but that is not taken into evidence. We have a lot to pay for. Now, let me just say something about abolition of prisons. There are certain things which need to go immediately. Loitering, hawking. First of all, loitering without intent is directly a colonial law. It was the idea that if you are in a certain place after six o'clock and you have not moved back to the quarters that were deigned as African quarters, then you have no reason to be here. What is the definition of loitering? Like if I just go outside the building and I stand there? You generally, you unless you are able to prove that there's a reason why you are on these streets. But why must I? I'm a citizen. 
there you go why must you why must you prove that you have an abode when we know that we have homeless people number one and number two we do not have a grid system of addresses why must i prove that i have the right to be in my own country yeah exactly why i mean why am i not so why do we stand? still have that law in our law books today in the year of our lord 2023 really because we are still allowing for avenues for criminalization of people who do not sound like or look like you and I. And that is over 60% of the population in Kenya. Wherein lies the justice? And those are the things that we have to look at. And then into economic empowerment. When we are seeing a growth in the number of people who are in remand or who are going through the criminal justice system because of a crime uh, a poverty related crime it needs to stop and the alert beyond that we've got a problem that we are now criminalizing poverty and criminalizing poverty in and of itself should be telling us something about who we are As that we are unable to accept where we are and that we see that there are those and there are us and then there's another one um nebulous laws like conspiracy conspiracy to defraud where you can conspire incidentally you can conspire by yourself in your own mind you can conspire your by thoughts. yourself and that can get you to jail i know of a case right now that we are prosecuting yes. well we're not currently prosecuting today because otherwise i couldn't speak about it but i know of cases where there are people who are serving more than 10 years for conspiring with unnamed persons or conspiring them and their own companies to defraud somebody else. So they didn't actually defraud anybody. What's the conspiracy? How, Olivia, conspire by yourself, please. I, I invite you to figure out how you would be conspiring by yourself or with yourself. And so there are charges like these which defy the natural laws of justice. Renee, Teresa, we need to say goodbye to our audience joining us on KTN News, but we are continuing on Spice FM on all our terrestrial frequencies and, of course, the live stream on standardmedia.co.ke. Double O Direct every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Woman host music by women, only women guests, but research shows, research suggests, 75%, sometimes 80% of you are men. Thank you for being allies. With me are two phenomenal women, Renee Ngamau, activist and lawyer, and Teresa Njiroge, executive director and founder of Clean Start. Can you please bookmark the Spice FM YouTube page? Because this is one conversation you want to go back to over and over and over again and really understand where we are as a society and why we have decided to criminalize poverty. Renee, before we took a break, you were telling me about the children and what happens when their primary caregivers are incarcerated. When they become homeless. When you see children on the street, check Saturday mornings on particular roads. You'll see a sudden influx of children who are begging. Look at the day, Saturday morning, Friday night, those children's mothers are probably in jails in police stations nearby for various petty offenses and looking even beyond the petty offenses and you'll read some of the stories if you come onto our website on um, clean start some of the stories of drug mules have you ever asked yourself why most drug mules are women and women of a certain economic status we need to start asking ourselves the questions that are beyond the surface of the stories and the images that we ask that we are given How, why we have such a huge number at some point of prostitutes and then that number shrinks as the economy becomes better and then it grows as the economy becomes more strained why is it and begin to link our macroeconomics to our criminalization remember that criminalizing poverty was never something that came out of either our pre-colonial african systems because we had systems in place that catered for everyone's basic needs but that these were crimes that came out of a need to what the English call kettle, which is to, to corral and to cater for a people and to ensure that they remained within a certain cadre. There is no dignity in poverty at all. So let me move across and just say, remember I said to you earlier, some of our solutions are simple. Yes. Not easy, but they're simple. 
There are a number of things that we can do immediately that can change the trajectory of this story even from Monday morning. Number one is to have a centralized and released record of the number of people who are arrested and the crimes for which they have been arrested. Those statistics and those numbers will tell the story in and of themselves. Why don't we have that? Number two, these are the questions, and, and that's why I'm telling you this is, it's, it's, it's simple. We don't need to do a lot of things. Number two is to link the process of arrest uh, and the, the, um, the information relating to arrest, link that system, and we already have an electronic uh, system for logging in and for booking people who have gone into um, uh, to jail at police stations who have been arrested, linking it to an investigation that sits in some place. It might not be open to the public, even to the potential um, accused then, because it's still the process of investigation, to the system that sits within the ODPP. So that there's a link between the investigation, the level and the weight of the evidence produced so the ODPP can make an informed decision as to whether this person should be arraigned in the first place or not. I told you, I have a, uh, 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 um, an incident of arrest. We protested against a local tycoon who was grabbing a playground. And I, I, at the time, I was serving as the chair of Amnesty International Kenya, and I went out and I was part of this protest, but I was the only one arrested, which was fine. That's another conversation. Uh, and taken to, um, to, to a local police station. On Monday, when I was arraigned in court, so I was released on personal cognizance, which is another thing. I was released on pub, uh, personal cognizance. Why? So you didn't is, have to play, pay any kind of bail or anything? Is the law different? for different cadres of people. Justice is supposed to be blind, but is ours truly blind? Or has ours received the miracle of sight and biased sight? But let's fast forward. And I'm putting out all of these questions so that as you listen and hear this story, you can see the manifest injustices. Even on a personal level, I get to court on Monday morning. From your house where you slept? From my house where I slept because I had been released. Mm. I get to court on Monday. And the file has not been brought to court in the first place, which means that if I'm employed or if I had uh, I was going out to do some work or to look for money as a mama for, I have lost that day to the inefficiency of a system that is a lot more powerful than I am. The file was not found. The file had not been brought to court. So what am I doing in court on Monday and why has that not been communicated to me beforehand? All of these are the petty injustices and the indignities that we go through that the women that we are fighting for go through. Then I go, I'm sent to back to the police station. When we arrive at the police station, the officer says, well, hang on, the ODPP has asked back for this file. But remember, it's my name. And you and I and us sitting here hold a cachet in name that many others don't. The ODPP looks through it and just points out the most obvious thing. It says eight men. Why have you arrested a woman? Let's just start with that. Who are these eight men? We don't know who the eight men were. Neither do any of the other people who were protesting know who the eight men are, were. So the file says but, eight men were. But the charge is malicious damage. Malicious damage of a structure that was being built on a public playground. Who is the criminal? Is it the person who is protesting the... Uh, illegal allocation of a public ground for children who cannot stand up for themselves or is it the person who has grabbed the land and is now building a structure for which there not only has there not been any public participation but there's a deprivation to the public there's a public a theft of public property that person was never charged the person who protested was the one who was arranged to court but let's just keep going if we had a linkage of all of that evidence, today there should be an investigating officer who should not be at work or who should have received some sanction. It, it seems like our justice system needs to be introduced to the cloud because also why does a file have to be physically brought anywhere in this day and age? And now you link it to my next point. The entirety of our judicial 
uh, of our judiciary, particularly of the courts, with the exception of a few courts, has now been modernized to the place where there is recording equipment, particularly for courts such as uh, the Economic Crimes Courts, mm -hmm. the High Court, the Court of Appeal. Why are we... Why are magistrates still taking down evidence by hand in the age of Fathom, Fireflies, uh, any number of recording and transcribing services? Because if that record of transcription was available to the accused, and many of our accused do not have legal representation, remember that. But if they could actually read what the evidence said, they could mount some kind of credible defense. But when they do not have a copy of what has been said and they are undergoing what is a very pressure filled traumatic experience, that of sitting opposite somebody who is accusing you and who has the name sergeant, investigating officer, corporal, etc. Then they don't have an opportunity to actually go through their own evidence and neither does the magistrate because they're having to handwrite. Imagine handwriting the speed at which we're talking and you've got to write down all of the evidence. These are simple things that would change the trajectory of our judiciary, of our investigations, of the ODPP, all of which are already doing a good job but could do a better job so that we ensure that there's justice. And then there's one thing which must be passed immediately. The reforms that are now ongoing with the National Council on the Administration of Justice for the penal code, for the sexual and gender based violence um, and for the criminal procedure code. Those needs. Parliament does not need to do any other work right now. It needs to deal with those so that immediately we decriminalize everything that needs to be decriminalized. We bring justice into the books. And then we proceed from a footing where hopefully there is better justice for all. Plus, we're a silicon savannah. Can we actually use the technology that we're busy touting to the rest of the world that we are at the forefront of Africa for being? Her name is Renee Ngamau. I'm also joined by Teresa Njiroge. We're talking about life after prison. Spice FM 94.4 in Nairobi. You're listening to Double O Direct. I'm Olivia Oteno with you every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Woman host, music by women, woman guests. Thank you so much to my woman in fashion today, Helen Talbert. Mm. The brand, Ellen underscore design underscore. <laughs> She's responsible for this phenomenal jacket that I'm wearing. And she said, Olivia, next time, a dress. Oh. And let me tell you, the finishing is so fine. Awesome. The finishing is so smooth. Mm -hmm. the, this is slow fashion. Mm -hmm. These are clothes that are made to last. This is something you could actually hand down. When's the last time you thought about handing down anything you're wearing? <laughs> you to know? Any of your, when's the last time? <laughs> yeah. To hand down Nini. Maybe one handbag, <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> if huh? it survives. <laughs> yes. But we're talking about life after prison mm -hmm. and the criminal justice system and the imbalance mm. because you know when it comes to justice we talk about balance mm. the imbalance that we have here in kenya i'm joined by two phenomenal women i have renee gamal who's an activist and a lawyer and i have Teresa Njoroge, who is the executive director and founder of clean start and i was shocked i should have done more research yeah but i don't want to google too much because then i can't have a natural reaction mm. i was shocked to discover that you are actually incarcerated for an entire year mm. renee you've been talking about something i'm gonna move over to Teresa now and give you a chance mm -hmm. to say a few words sure so the there's a problem and as women we realize that no one's coming to change what we're seeing are the gaps and what needs to be changed uh, precisely what Renee has been talking about. And so as formerly imprisoned women, we came together and, and, and said, you know what? Um, we are so close to the problem, hence closer to the solutions. We know where the gaps are. And I want to speak to that point and say, when we were in prison and to date, we continue seeing people coming to say, this is what is good for you and not involving those who have been incarcerated as you come up with the solutions why go sit wherever you'll go sit and come up with a solution for those who are imprisoned and those who are rebuilding their lives post in prison who told you that's the best solution she who wears the shoe is the one who knows where it pinches, where it pinches. so well said we know where the gaps are we know what the problem is involve us when you're coming up with the solutions. And we saw over and over again that we were not involved. I think 
from a thought of line that because I'm imprisoned, then either my mind is not functioning well or whatever it is we continue seeing as, you know, the decriminalizing, the, the, the criminalizing, the, the, the stigmatization. You think that um, my, my thoughts are not good enough. And so we continued seeing solutions. You have solutions. nothing to contribute to society. You You've know, been to prison. Written you know, off, yeah, done yeah, with. Yeah. But we were like, no, we can come up with the solutions ourselves and nothing for us without us. So we came up with a dignified rehabilitation program, which we call the Ufunuo program, opening up, re revelation, you know, envisioning. So the Ufunuo leadership program, as we call it, is a dignified rehabilitation program that I'm proud to say works. 4,000 women who have been impacted by the criminal justice system have been through this program are now rebuilding their lives post imprisonment and none of them have gone back into the system so this program works and in this program it covers all soft skills uh, communication forgiveness trauma healing um, counseling uh, visioning um, entrepreneurship through renaissance uh, circles of healing super circles um, financial uh, financial empowerment and you know we've spoken to the women and men who are in prisons and say to them what would you like to be empowered with as you're going through this program and as well the formerly imprisoned women so it's the imprisoned and formerly imprisoned people who've contributed to coming up with a curriculum and then we've got people from I want to give a shout out to Citibank uh, Standard Chartered Bank uh, and many other corporates and individuals uh, Dr. Patricia uh, through Breakthrough and Renee Ngama, of course, our board director, who've contributed to strengthening this curriculum. Safal so Group? Safal so Group. So I'm coming to that. That's the second part of the of, of the of the engagement so when they've been once they've been through the ufunua leadership program which which deals with the body the mind the soul the rebuilding of the individual the person they then need to be empowered with skills and that's where i want to really give a shout out to chindaria foundation because he had us as imprisoned women and has invested a workshop state-of-the-art workshop at langata women maximum prison 13 million kenya shillings of a state-of-the-art workshop where the women now get the skills in tailoring in bakery and all manner of other skills when they come out they're now able to go and fend for themselves in decent ways but we have a gap mm -hmm. Chandaria Foundation has come in and supported us and are continuing to support us because they want to do the same kind of a workshop at Shimola Tewa and they want to continue with an ICT hub and so on and so forth. But we do not have the same kind of investment on the outside. So the woman will leave prison very well empowered through the Ufunua program, through the workshop. But then when they come out, there is no facility or workshop that enables this woman to continue earning a decent means of livelihood so they're stigmatized uh as a result of having of being former inmates yes a lot of stigma you're formally imprisoned you cannot get a certificate of good conduct which every employer wants mm -hmm. to see because of that criminal record their societies and their communities no longer want to accept them back because of this criminal tag that they have on them yes but remember she's still a mother 90 percent of them are mothers she still needs to find a place to stay she needs to still needs to fend for her children clothing education health and so on and so forth so she needs to make a living and so i, I really want to uh thank citibank who've given us 2.5 million recently with which we've set up five hubs but we need people more people to come in and support us across the country we've got chapters in Taitata Veta, Wundanyi, Busia, El, uh, Eldoret, Nakuru, Nyeri, Muranga we've got all these uh, chapters clean start chapters. clean start mm -hmm. uh, um, circles of healing and chapters that are made up of formerly imprisoned women we're trying as much as we can with the little resources that we have but all hands on deck to get this done because the problem is we've got 500,000 formerly imprisoned women waiting online mm. to get support and some of the women i.e someone like Fatia who runs a restaurant 
near Quaya. She wants to run this restaurant and employ other women. That's the kind of module we have. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, very peer-led, a lot of sisterhood. Yes. Uh, we've got a movement, the Coalition of Formerly Imprisoned Women. The women want to support one another but they can only support each other with, with with the little support that they have so if you're a corporate out there you've got csr you've got cash that you can offer you've got equipment that you can offer you can mentor these women we're calling on each and every person whatever it is that you can do helps including clothing we were talking about the beautiful elaine uh, design including clothes these women have been um ripped off Every little thing that they had before they went through the system and they're coming out to zero, nothing. So every little bit that you can do, training, mentoring, offering equipment, whether it's in textiles, sewing machines, materials, whether it's in bakery, the equipment, whatever you can offer, we're willing and ready. Get in touch with us through Clean Start. Go to our website. Go to, we are on Clean Start Kenya on all social media. Our offices are in Kileleshua, uh, Tabere Crescent. Reach out to Clean Start. And we've got all these offices and chapters across the country. And let's do something to, re to reintegrate those who are coming out of prisons successfully. Have you had any communications with similar programs or sister programs in other countries that have helped you and mentored you and um, facilitate a dialogue on, on how to overcome potential obstacles or certain obstacles? Yes, and a lot of them in the U.S. I want to give a shout out to A New Way of Life that's, that was founded and is run by Susan Barton, who was formerly imprisoned in the U.S. She's an American, and now she's in partnership with Clean Start to set up the first safe house because we do not have a safe space where a woman upon release from prison goes to rest she's some of most of them go to hospitals streets uhuru park wherever look for support from other other women um but thankfully through the support of susan buttons a new way of life we're going to set up the first safe house and through their support as well the house we have in kileleshua at least if a woman comes out of prison today on monday she has a space where she can come and rest but we need a lot more of those so a new way of life has been one of those the elevate prize with funding ford foundation with cash funding um Siegel family foundation with a lot of funding a lot of support so there are quite a number of international organizations that are supporting clean starts work and wanting to see the work not just spread across the country but across the continent renee let me just add to that but it, it's got to be a, an African solution by Africans owned by us. And I, at this point, I think Teresa is deferring from what these women have done themselves. These women will raise 15,000 shillings and give it to women who are coming out of prison as a grant so that she can go and actually get herself a room with her children. They'll put together utensils, whatever it is that they have, so that she has some stuff when she gets home. So yeah, she has some cooking things and some food and some clothes and then they'll give them a grant of 15,000 shillings and put them within one of these hubs which are really like chamas where other women who have who have gone before them welcome them and just show them the ropes so that they can be able to establish themselves and now as we start working around the economic activities then they come in directly into work so we're not waiting just to be employed we know the unemployment problem in kenya we're also creating some of our own employment and it's things like you know the stone pressing uh, machine yes there are women who are actually making and selling stones honey and bee um beekeeping for honey and harvesting honey um clothing and textiles and creating and making school uniforms and clothes through tailoring it's absolutely every work that they are can do. these commodities or is this list of entrepreneurship available on the website because just as you know renee's been talking one thing i always look for is authentic honey i don't know why I, it's so hard to get so if i know someone who knows someone who knows that this bee the honey came from here that i would buy yeah Clothing. mulu hills please <laughs> note that we need to sell honey here we've got someone who is running um who is working with uh, other farmers to put together 600 hives 600 hives in Yamulu Hills which is somewhere out in, out in Cumberland so are these listed services on the clean start website yes we have we, we have all these services listed on our website on our social media pages and we have a catalog as well which you could 
you know see all the products from honey clothing um yeah the question now and you, as you've been talking has come to me and we'll take a break and then we'll come back to this is the certificate of good conduct because that more or less wipes you out from certain types of formal employment wipes right? you out from everyone yeah apart from maybe entrepreneurship and then of course there's the issue of then being formalized in the financial sector so we're going to come back to that and what can be done and to what levels it was done perhaps in other countries that we can gather learnings from Renee and Teresa Njoroge, she mm. is the executive director and founder of Clean Start. Shout out to Dr. Patricia Murugami. Hope wherever you are, mm. you are well, you are healthy, you are blessed because you have in some way helped this meeting to take place. Mm. Live stream, standardmedia.co.ke. This is Double O Direct. I am Olivia Otieno. I'm, there's just so much to unpack with regards to prison the justice system, incarceration, what happens post-incarceration. All of these amazing skills and learnings and growth mm -hmm. that inmates have excelled at. You know, they are tailors, they are bakers, they are carpenters, carpenters mm. you know, masons, ETC, yes. ETC, ETC, ETC. Yeah. And yet, certificate of good conduct. Where did... Uh -huh. The certificate of good conduct is the uh, almost the th I, th I would say the second most important document that you need or I'd put it as the third one. The first one is your birth certificate without which you do not really exist for the purpose of going to school, starting your education, having a record within uh, the school system. And the birth certificate, we're going to suspend that story for a while and the difficulty of a child who has been born in prison actually getting a birth certificate and therefore legitimately becoming a Kenyan. But I'm going to suspend that one. And I'm going to swing around to this one, which is a certificate of good conduct and why it's so important. Wait, 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 wait. But the second one is your ID? Your ID. Okay, fine. Yes. Now we go to the And now we're at the Certificate of Good Conduct. The Certificate of Good Conduct, as you know, is the one document that most employers will ask for, and rightly so. The Certificate of Good Conduct will enable there to be some kind of record of what is a Certificate of Good Conduct asking for, that you are a person of good conduct. Ultimately, it's asking, it's, it's some kind of referral from the government that says, yes, you are who you say you are, and yes, you are not a threat to society, and therefore you are employable. Now, if you've been through prison, there's something that you need to get before we get to the Certificate of Good Conduct, which is a Certificate of Discharge. It is a certificate that is provided for within the Prisons Act. Presently, it is not being given out. In it, There's no uniform certificate of discharge the certificate of discharge talks about when you went in when you came out what skills and experiences you have learned what conduct you have had within the prison system that allows you to show that during this gap when i was not in society i reformed i built myself i grew and therefore i am a person who is worthy not to be judged by what took me in but to be judged instead by who I have become as a process and who I have come out. That this certificate of discharge should be taken to the police and through the DCI and through that process so that you can get the certificate of good conduct. So even before we get to the certificate of good conduct, we are hampering our sisters and our brothers by not giving them the right kind of certificate of discharge then we come to the certificate of good conduct and if you don't have it it doesn't matter that we have built a 13 million shilling facility and that you have been working for the last six months two months one year ten years with ep said level sewing and knitting machines that today you are one of the best skilled potential employees within our export processing zone you will not be able to get that work because of this piece of paper and therefore we continue to perpetuate the injustice we need two things for the discharge certificate remember that step before the certificate of good conduct for the discharge certificate to be released number one is for that certificate to be uniform across all of the prisons mm. so that it's the same certificate some officers in charge god bless them know about this and are doing their best but they will give you something called a certificate of imprisonment boss oh, take no. that to an employer the end you know you were yeah. dead at, on arrival yes and so number one is is for it to be um uniform and we actually 
Clean Start women are spunky. Mm. They sat down and actually drafted what a certificate of discharge should look like from their own pain point and understanding the system that mm. they've been in. Mm. The second is we need discharge boards to be, first of all, constituted and mandated to sit at the very least three times in a year so that they can be able to go through all of the records of all of the people who are going to be released within the next four to six months and also to work on the backlog and and sign out these certificates of discharge so that these people actually have their documentation with why them. don't they ha why don't they sit right now they're not constituted so i know the next question why are they not constituted well olivia that is the subject of another show but let me tell you when then what is possible and what what they are what the women are doing i don't want this to be a story only of despair these are women who have decided that they are changing this country even though they are still rejected for the most part by the same country that they are born to they're creating the jobs for themselves mm -hmm. but we took it a step further and with the programs that we're talking to you about through first of all ufunua and then going through the super circles and anzisha to help them to start their own businesses with as little as 15 well now with inflation it's about 20,000 shillings yes. to get them to start jobs that uh, to get them to start businesses that give them dignified pay i want to pause you right there because i don't understand with regards to former inmates or the formerly incarcerated what rights and privileges do you have vis-a-vis -vis those that you do not have can you go and get a pin you know can, uh, what is still allowed to you and what needs to change because if you cannot be form formally employed you need to start some sort of business and transact and can you open a bank account you know Teresa maybe you can shed light on that and then we'll come back to Renee those are some of the obstacles and hurdles that are there some of our women can open bank accounts. We can open the coalition of formerly imprisoned women bank account because of those hurdles. Um, when I, I remember a woman recently who got into prison with her son due to a land issue uh, where she was married. And the son then post imprisonment um, wanted to travel to Dubai or someplace in the Middle East for work. And he couldn't because he couldn't get his passport processed. Why? Because he doesn't ha have all the uh, all the required documentation. Why? Because of the imprisonment issue. So it 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 holds you back. This imprisonment, lawful, legally or not legally, it continues to hold you back even after you've served your time. Even after you've served your time, and now this is the imprisonment that people don't see because you're not behind bars but you're held back on so many accounts the stigma the fact that you can't get correct documentation to be able to either get formal employment or process documentation whenever need be that social in that secondary imprisonment is what people don't see and this is where a lot of work and the probation and aftercare department really need to come down on this one advocate together with those who are formerly incarcerated to create awareness nationally that people who are coming out of prison if we truly believe that our system works and that i got in prison to serve a one year two year ten years then if our system works then i've come out rehabilitated corrected and so i am fit to come back into society Pause. i paid my debt i want to understand uh renee percentages of imprisoned persons vis-a-vis -vis the level of crime because i don't understand are, are prisons filled with murderers are prisons filled with white collar crime you know where is the bulk of our, our, our prisoners coming from okay that's great so i'm going to talk about the imprisonment of women we did a study uh, that we released in july of uh, 2022 and in that study which, as we clean started, uh, clean started, started yes, yes which is titled rethinking the bars and you can find the study actually on our website as well um uh, and, and uh, we just looked at the access and the administration of justice for women who commit pre petty offenses but we looked at the entirety of the um population of uh, jails women's prisons in kenya get this number 74 percent seven four sabatne just so we're really clear 74 of the women who are in prison today are in prison for petty non uh, petty poverty related non-violent crimes now let's start there that is to say that a prison that is holding today 5, 500 women 
800 women, even one that is holding in remand, a thousand women, only 250 really need to be there. Okay. Oh, no, not need to be there. Only 250 have been, have been um, charged with crimes that are not poverty related, non-violent crimes. And that's where we need to start. Then, so, so that, and the, the challenge with women in prison, unlike men in prison, and I'm just going to make this distinction, is because they're caught for these petty offenses, misdemeanors, they go to prison for very short periods of time. And therefore, they're not really able to learn any long-term skills, such as paralegal and other skills that are a lot more, that require a little bit more time for them to be in one place. And this is why we've been seeing in the past so many who are coming out uneducated, unreformed with no other um, choices. The other thing is that the population is a lot higher because even though we're maintaining 3,000, for example, or 4,000 women in prison, it's not the same 4,000 in a year. It's not even the same 4,000 if you take a snapshot in a week because they're such short-term uh, sentences. So the turnover is very high and therefore the interventions have got to be very, very quick. And that's where the focus needs to be. To something that Teresa had said, which I want to underscore, which is not just the stigma within society, but the structural stigma. Mm. What we're talking about within the certificates of good conduct, banks that will not allow uh, that accounts be opened by formerly imprisoned women, even though they have uh, an entire judgment that acquits them, that overturns the conviction, which means that that conviction was unstable in the first place and therefore they should not be judged. We just had the situation not a few months ago where we have been moving from bank to bank and I shall not name you, you know yourselves, mm. where they shut the doors on these women. And yet these are economically viable businesses. So here's what we've done. Mm. Now, let me correct something which uh, a lot of people see, watch on TV and assume. Mm. There are some pluses about our system. In the US, for example, there has been a great push that if you have been jailed for a felony, you should be allowed to vote because in some states it took away your right to vote. We don't have that in Kenya. In Kenya, in fact, you can vote while in prison, which is important because it's a constitutional right. But we've got to work towards the structural uh, stigma. Yes. Now, the women have been doing things that are really quite incredible. One is around this economic empowerment. She talked about Fatia. I can tell you about Betty Kaguhia and so many other women who are running businesses that are making, that are turning over hundreds of thousands of shillings, but they cannot access loans, which you and I running the same kind of business can because they're formally imprisoned and because they, they are unbankable. It's not only a question of um, the justice of it. It's a question of the sense and the financials and the profits of it. It makes no sense. So here's what we've done in addition to everything that Teresa has done. Oh, we're, we're not going down like that. We've now created even a show where we showcase 30 women from different cadres of life, some of whom are walking out of shelters to come and make a pitch to make to get access to finance, and some of whom have been imprisoned. And we put it out on YouTube and we want people to watch and see if they can tell who the formerly imprisoned are. If they cannot, then why are we stigmatizing at corporate and at government level? Renee Ngamau, activist lawyer, Teresa Njiroge, executive director and founder of Clean Start, to be continued. To be continued. <laughs> to be continued because I was expecting the Ngong Hills. Yeah. You gave me the Alps. <laughs> so um, thank you. It has been a lot, a lot, a lot of food for thought. We are circling back to this could be as early as next week or the week after that. We are nowhere near done. There's a lot to edit and package and upload. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for involving me because now you've involved me. Now I'm involved, right? Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. The fight continues. Thank you very much, Olivia. I